Howdy folks, welcome back to another out of spec renew video. And today you join me swapping out the old 85 kilowatt hour pack from this 2014 model S P85 plus for a 100 kilowatt hour pack. Um, yeah, let's get into it. So as I mentioned there in the intro, this right here is a 2014 model S P85 plus. And for those of you in the know with older Teslas, you may, may or may not know, but Tesla never equipped a rear wheel drive Model S with a 100 kilowatt hour battery from the factory. So this is actually gonna be my first time swapping a 100 kilowatt hour pack into a rear wheel drive car. Uh, I know that it's totally doable. There's folks that do it all the time, but this is gonna be the first one I've personally done. Uh, I've already pulled out the old 85 kilowatt hour pack, which is right here. This actually has a weak short in one of the modules or one of the bricks within one of the modules. So it's actually got a cell that's internally shorted that's causing the rest of the cells in the brick around it to self discharge. So it's not really rebuildable in this kind of state without doing some, some other major work. This customer actually has sort of a third party warranty. Their coverage is maxed out for the pack replacement though. So they decided since they're paying the difference anyways, they wanna go ahead and upgrade to a 100 kilowatt hour pack. So that's what we're doing here. This one is a newer build, 100 kilowatt hour, which you can tell based on the brown lid here. The earlier ones would have still had this black uh, main lid here, but the penthouse cover still would have been sort of the greenish gray color. The newer build ones have this brown penthouse. So we're going to be swapping that pack into the car here. And uh, I'm just going to kind of give you guys a brief overview of the process. I have a very detailed video on the 100 kilowatt hour pack swap that I did on my personal car, which is a 2015 Model S 70D. Um, there's only really one modification that we need to make to the pack in order for it to fit in the car. And that is to swap out this ring right here around the high voltage rapid mate connector. The old one is this orange ring. So this is what used to be there. And this one is slightly taller. It's meant to fit the rapid splitter system. The older cars use a different style high voltage rapid mate. So they have this um, lower seal surface. Uh, so yeah, that's just a part that bolts on, super easy to swap out. Everything else about this pack is fully bolt in. Um, there's really not a huge weight difference between the two packs. I know that a lot of people bring, up a, bring that up as a concern, but the weight difference between this pack and this pack is less than 200 pounds. So, you know, near as makes no real difference in terms of the capability of the car. It's not like it's a huge weight differential. I mean, it is a fair amount of weight, but it's well within the capabilities of the car's, uh, you know, suspension and all that stuff. Uh, I mean, you're basically talking about one extra passenger's worth of weight in the car. Uh, this car is equipped with air suspension, so no adjustments required there. The air suspension can compensate for the weight, no problem. If it were coil suspension, we would probably want to think about replacing the struts. I can tell you on my personal car, I didn't end up swapping out struts, and it's perfectly fine. Like I said, not a huge weight difference. Uh, but yeah, with the air suspension, not a problem. Anyway, at this point, we're going to uh, go ahead and get this battery up on the table. I'm going to go ahead and get it bolted into the car. And the main thing that I'm going to show is sort of the pairing process to get this pack in and set up paired with the car via toolbox. All right, so we've got the new pack positioned under the car, ready to go. Like I said, I'm not going to go too into detail on the whole installation process here. I've got a much more detailed video that shows all of that. Uh, that was done earlier this year. So I'm just gonna kind of time lapse through all this and we'll pick up when I actually get to the stage where we do the pairing between the battery and the car.
our battery pack is fully installed. I've gone ahead and reconnected the 12 volt battery and the high voltage service disconnect. So let's go ahead and hop in the car and see what we've got. So of course we're gonna have a bunch of mismatch alerts, 78% state of charge apparently. We are still showing P85 plus. Uh, we are in service mode. Let's go ahead and look at service alerts. Actually, we might as well see if, if the car will actually do anything if we try and hit the brake pedal. Okay, yeah, so it says unable to drive. There's BMS version mismatch, etc., etc. BMS power supply, okay. Unable to charge 12 volt. Yeah, so we've got all the typical typical stuff for our mismatch. I don't like the BMS power supply alert. Hopefully that doesn't cause a problem for us. Maybe my low voltage rapid mate isn't as fully seated as I would like it to be, but I don't see any MIA alerts. So I guess that's a plus. But let's go ahead and start with a software reinstall. We are connected to our Wi-Fi here. So let's go back to that software reinstall. We'll go ahead and hit reinstall and let that go through its process. It'll probably take 15, 20 minutes or something. So I'll bring you guys back in once the redeploy has finished. All right, so it looks like the car completed its firmware redeploy. I actually just did a full software update on it. And as you can see, it does still say it's a P85 plus, but we no longer get complaints for a firmware mismatch. If I put my foot on the brake, you can see the car is on. Let's see if we can put it into gear. And we can. Awesome. So we want to do... So our next step is that we need to do our battery replacement routine, which will update the pack config info. So I'm going to go ahead and get my laptop set up with Toolbox, and we'll get connected, and we'll do that process. All right, so we've got Toolbox pulled up here. I haven't actually connected to the car yet, but we are plugged in. So I've got our cable that runs around over to the side here. Now, of course, for Legacy Model S, depending on build date, this connector can be in different locations. It's either on the left side of the dash here on the earlier cars. On the later cars, they put it right underneath the cubby here in the center console. Um, but yeah, so we're plugged in there. Now, in theory, at this point, the car is actually fully functional. We could call it good. It actually still has full usable range. Uh, if I, well, I'm already in display here. So if I switch to distance, you can see it's showing 244 miles. If I switch back to percentage, it's showing 78%. So fully charged, it should be around 310-ish, which is correct for the 100 kilowatt hour pack with this vehicle's configuration. Uh, so it's going to display the correct range and everything. It's just that the vehicle's configuration is still not correct. So we are going to go ahead and go back here. I just wanted to show you guys the alert for the BMS uh, voltage, input voltage um, alert is gone. I think that's just a little bit of a glitch that had something to do with the firmware issue. We do have a battery coolant heater that needs to be replaced as well. I'm going to be doing that on this car later. But what we want to do here is we want to go ahead and connect to the vehicle. Now this is on MCU1, so it's going to take a little bit to go through its whole process. Uh, it has to do this CCAF unlock routine. So we've got a special program downloaded that works in conjunction with Toolbox. Um, what the heck is it even called? I don't remember. Uh... I think it's just called Toolbox Proxy. That's what it is. So that's that guy right there. It's not a program we can actually open up. It's just something that works in conjunction with Toolbox in order to allow Toolbox 3 to work on MCU-1 equipped vehicles. So it takes a minute to go through its whole routine there. Sometimes it could be a little bit finicky and it might not connect on the first try. But once that gets connected, I'll bring you guys back and we'll go through the pack replacement routine which should update our vehicle configuration to reflect all of the right info. All right, it took two tries, but we are finally fully connected to the car. 
we want to go up here to the search tab that opens up this additional little tab here and we want to go to actions i can actually click on it there we go actions and then i want to go to battery so post hv battery replacement that's what we want to go to maybe if i can actually click on it properly there we go uh, vehicle gateway is unlocked don't know why it says it's locked first responder loop is connected so we did our can redeploy already then we want to do this routine and that should update our configs to what they need to be um don't remember how long this takes but it shouldn't take too long five or ten minutes or something maybe um but yeah so we'll let that go through its procedure and then once it's finished the car should show its correct config in fact let's go ahead and just go to software so we'll go to software here and it'll actually have to reboot the gateway when it's finished so the screen will have to turn off it'll turn back on and then we should get p100 plus i don't know if it'll actually add the plus onto it or if it'll just show it as a p100 um, but i'm hoping we'll get to see p100 plus because that's pretty slick um, but yeah this step like i said not strictly necessary i certainly recommend it I know folks who have done these pack swaps before and are still running their car on the old config info. Um, I know a guy who's just a little ways north of here, actually. Uh, shout out Brian Kelly. He did a 100 kilowatt hour swap on his P85D, I believe, and he has never actually done this routine on it. So his software still says P85D, but he still has full usable range with the 100 kilowatt hour pack. Um, but yeah, this procedure does require a toolbox subscription to do. Again, toolbox subscription is not super expensive or anything. Uh, it's 75 bucks for 24 hour access. Or if you know somebody who has it, uh, it's totally possible to, uh, to get that done. So we'll let that go through its routine here. And then we should have this fully up to date. All right, well, it took a few tries to actually get the car fully connected and be able to run the routine because this car is on MCU-1, and MCU-1 just causes all sorts of problems. Little PSA, if you have an older Model S or Model X, this is another reason to add to the list why an MCU-2 upgrade is worth it because MCU-1 just makes it super difficult to do service procedures where MCU-2 is basically a breeze. But our routine has completed. The car is currently rebooting, and as you can see on our instrument cluster there, we've got P100. So I guess it doesn't add the plus in when we do the 100 swap on this, but that's okay. It doesn't really matter. Um, but yeah, we'll go ahead and let this thing reboot here. Make sure we have no other alerts. Like I said, I am still going to need to do the battery coolant heater, um, which, uh, yeah. Yeah. That's another thing to take care of on this car, but after that, it's good to go. But as far as the pack swap itself, this is pretty much it and relatively straightforward other than just MCU-1 shenanigans. And that's just par for the course on these older cars. Like I said, good reason to do MCU-2 retrofit besides the other perks that you get is it makes serviceability way simpler. Um, yeah, MCU-1 just almost never works first try for anything because it's super buggy to work with for Toolbox. All right, our screen is fully booted up here. I got it back into the service alerts tab, and you, as you can see, all we've got is our battery heater related stuff and this electric power steering assist. That's just kind of normal faults for these early cars to have. And then MCU-1 FPS crawling, because slow MCU-1 things, the frame rate is not having a good time on it. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much it there. Um, we can go ahead and X out of here, and we're basically good to go at this point. If we go ahead and go back to our software tab, you can see we also get P100 here as well. And yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, Simple as that. 
and that is a 100 kilowatt hour pack swap complete. Alrighty folks, well that's a wrap for this one. Another day, another pack upgrade completed. Like I said, this was my first uh, 100 kilowatt hour pack swap on a rear wheel drive Model S. So just kind of wanted to go through the process of what that actually looks like. I've gotten a bunch of questions about it um, from the comments on my previous 100 kilowatt hour pack swap videos. And uh, there you have it, totally doable. Nothing really special required other than you know, just a firmware redeploy to actually get the car functioning. And if you want the displays to show the correct information, you just have to go into toolbox and do the pack replacement routine. Uh, of course, we did run into the MCU one issues with this car. Like I said, that is another reason to add to the list that makes it a good idea to do an MCU two retrofit on these older cars. Uh, it really makes serviceability a lot easier in the future. Um, Another kind of side note related to that is if you do have really any Tesla for that matter, do not skip doing software updates. If you skip doing software updates for more than two years, the car loses its security certificates to perform software updates and such, and it makes it impossible to do component replacements without the car going to a service center to have the certificates renewed. So that's another thing to keep in mind is make sure to keep your software updates at least reasonably up to date um and yeah so anyway this one's finished up other than the battery coolant heater which i'm still waiting on some parts on to finish up but that's going to do it for this one as always thanks for watching